Okay, well, thank you for coming to our uh, se uh, science seminar series. We do have this uh, twice a month or once a month. Um, and these se series are sponsored by the Institute of Regenerative Medicine, or CIRM. Um, the bio biotechnology program here at, UC uh, at uh, BCC uh, received a grant, and it's basically for students to do an internship at UC Berkeley, or at UCSF, or at Children's Hospital in Oakland. And they do uh, research in stem cells. And tonight we are joined by Professor Daniel, Daniela Kaufer from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, Professor Kaufer's research addresses several aspects of stress on the brain from physiological insults on the brain to the molecular and cellular events inside the brain. I need to mention that two of our biotechnology uh, students um, were having their in internship at her lab, and that was Laura Fry and Dave Hulihan. Um, and they had a great time there. Uh, so let me introduce you to Dr. Daniel Kaufer, and please help me introduce her. Right. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for having me here today. That's a real pleasure to be able to come and talk here, and I have to tell you that um, those were really, really mutual experiences. I loved having uh, the students in my lab. It was such a, a great experience. It's completely changed my mind. I never wanted to take anybody that comes in for short times, like six, eight months, and it was such great experiences that now I do. Right, so we're going to talk today about stress, and I'll start with something that I think most of you are too young to know, <laughs> probably. So if I tell you I have one word for you, plastics, right? How many people know the reference? Do you know what movie it is? <laughs> yeah, all the people my age. This is from a movie called The Graduate, where... Um, where he tells them the future is in plastics, right? So we're not going to talk about plastics today, but we're going to talk about plasticity, and brain plasticity specifically. And this is what my lab studies. We look at the neurobiology of plasticity, the ability of the brain to respond to different things around it, to change according to what's happening around it. And we do that in several levels of, of uh, measurements, several levels of analysis. We look at the genomic level, at gene expression, changes at neural circuits, uh, network level of plasticity in the brain. We look at uh, physiology. We use a tool called optogenetics that changes uh, or lets us activate and deactivate specific um, neurons. We look at behavior. We look at learning. We look at memory. So we integrate a lot of different levels of analysis from molecular to physiology to system level to behavior to answer our questions. We also do that across the lifespan. You'll see some of that today. We're not going to talk about everything that we do in the lab, uh, but we start from very early on in life. We actually have uh, a newer project that also I won't talk about, but you're very welcome to ask me about. We were looking even at the preconception stress, what happens when the stress happens in the parents before the conception even happened, and then what happens in stress that comes early on in life, what happens when stress is during your adolescent years, uh, during puberty, turns out this is a very critical period for brain development, what happens in adulthood, and what happens in aging? How is all of that different in aging? And I won't get to all of that today, but we'll talk a little bit about somewhere around here. When we're thinking about stress effects and about plasticity and about how the brain responds to things, we're also thinking about the context, the environment, the social interactions, that goes on, the learning, uh, the memory, the, how complex the environment is, all of those things play a role in that. And there's another project that I won't really get into today, but tell you that we're doing in the lab, which is looking at pathology, 
is plasticity always good? Is more plasticity always the best thing that you can have? And the answer is no, because sometimes when you have hyperplasticity, there's that much changes in the brain, we're following a process that's called epileptogenesis, how epilepsy develops. We're looking at traumatic brain injury or stroke and looking at the plasticity that follows that all the way to how we actually get to an epileptic brain. So not always the more the better. Within all of that, we're focusing on stem cells in the brain, and I'll tell you a lot about them, and this is how we uh, are connected to the CERM program. And so we'll focus on one aspect of the work in the lab today, and feel free to ask about anything else that's interest of you. I really have to start by mentioning the people that actually do the work, the graduate students and the postdocs in the lab, and a, a list of many, many, many undergrads that I can't list here. Uh, those are the people that work in my lab uh, currently and in the last few years that are involved in the project that I'll show you today, and you'll see their names and pictures as we come to specific uh, data sets. Uh, very thankful for funding agencies that let us do it, um, and a lot of good collaborators from, from UC Berkeley, from Stanford, and from around the world. Right, so why do we even look at stress? Why is it interesting? And I think that's sort of inherently interesting to almost everyone. So let's see, do you have any personal connection to that? How many of you have used the term stress, let's say in the past 24, 48 hours? Okay, <laughs> and I'm, I'm among you, and it wasn't just when I was teaching my Neurobiology of Stress course this morning. It was really a personal thing. What did you mean by it? Is somebody willing to say what was stress to them? Or how did you, yep. <laughs> I was actually reading, right before I came here, I was reading something about how, whether homework is important or not. It was a good piece. Yeah, I, I agree, but all right. So that's one stressor. Anybody else that is willing to say, yeah? Not knowing how to do something that I know I've been taught and like not understanding it. And like, yeah, stressing out about that because I'm like, I don't know how to do this. I don't understand how to apply this. And then information Yep. Totally can relate to that. Any others? Yeah. Yeah, I had a Kim yeah, yeah. I have a grant deadline coming next week. I can't tell you how much I feel your pain. And somebody else was answering? Uh, we had a Kim the term returns this week. <laughs> mm. Yeah. The terms. Hey, so sort of common to what everything that we're talking about is psychological stress, right? So those are things that we're worrying about. Those are not physical stressors. When we think about stress and we move to the animal kingdom, a lot of the things that are stressed to us will say uh, a zebra that's running away from a lion, right? The difference here is pretty big. And the difference between this acute stressor that we have to deal with at the moment and something that's chronically worrying us, we think about it, we ruminate about it, we sit there at night and we think about this deadline coming up or the midterm that's tomorrow or the homework that I didn't get in time, that's a big difference. And that's where a lot of those um, differential responses that could be very helpful on the short term but maybe detrimental on the long term come into play. So basically what I'm saying is that stress response is actually a good thing, right? The last thing that I want you to take out of this lecture is that stress is bad for you. Stress is really good for you, stress response. Being able to respond to a stressor around us, that's actually crucial. If we take that away from an animal, they will die with the first thing that goes wrong. If we take this, uh, we can take away part of the stress response system from a rodent, and the first time that the cage is changed, they're gonna die, because they're unable to deal with that little stressor even. Right? So the stress response is crucial, and it's what's let you survive through some kind of a threat in the environment. And what it um, mobilizes is this fight or flight response. So if you are a zebra and a lion comes after you, you definitely want to have a stress response there in place to be able to deal with that situation and maybe actually run away from it. There are two systems in the body that uh, are involved in that response, in mobilizing that response. One is the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system sort of has, you can think about it as two modes. 
One mode would be rest and digest. Everything's fine. I can just uh, take care of rebuilding my systems, uh, digesting my food, investing in the immune system, investing in the reproductive system. Everything's chill. Or fight or flight. It's a very alarming situation. All of the resources that I have have to go right now into surviving the situation. Nothing else is important. This is done through activation of two modes of the, of the autonomic nervous system called the parasympathetic or the sympathetic node. So under stress, there's going to be a sympathetic drive, and all of this energy is going to go into being very alert, very much in the moment, shuttling all the energy that you have, putting glucose into the bloodstream, putting uh, the muscles and the heart and everything can work so that you run away from the situation. The other system that comes into play is the endocrine system, your hormone secretion system. And that uh, activates the system that's called the HPA axis, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. What is this system? The hypothalamus is this nucleus in the brain. It's a center in the brain that is responsible for uh, controlling the secretion of a lot of hormones. It starts by secreting the first hormone in that, uh, in, in that chain. It's called CRH. Once this is secreted, it activates another part, which is the pituitary. The pituitary is sort of this um, neuroendocrine gland that's dangling right beneath the brain, and that has a second hormone that's activated now. This is called ACTH. This hormone goes out to the general circulation. It's in the blood. It activates a lot of different places, and one of the places is your adrenal glands. Your adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys, and they produce two things, adrenaline and this hormone called cortisol, which is uh, the stress hormone that we all think about when we think of the stress hormone. So now in response to all of this activation, we will have cortisol that's rising in our blood, in our circulation, and goes around all of the body and the brain. It actually goes and passes into the brain and activates everywhere that has a receptor for it. And here lies one of the key points every cell in your body have a receptor for that. So there are two receptors that can see cortisol. They're called glucocorticoid receptor, mineralocorticoid receptor. Every cell in our body have at least one of those. A lot of them have two of those receptors. And so every system in our body responds to stress because they have the right receptor to see it. The stress response physiology is such that it's gonna allow you to do the fight or flight response. And at the same time, suppress non-vital functions. So we're gonna see things like mobilizing energy, um, mobilizing, uh, increasing blood pressure, increasing ventilation, increasing heart rate, immune suppression, reproductive suppression, not really vital, right? You don't know that you're gonna survive the next hour, you're not planning to mate and generate the next generation. Uh, digestive tract, again, you're not gonna really worry about digesting your breakfast if you don't know you're surviving the next hour, so not really vital. Cardiovascular, when it works that hard, it's great in the moment, but chronically, we're gonna start seeing all of those effects build up, right? So chronically, if our cardiovascular system is all the time ap um, activated, there's gonna be wear and tear of it. Chronically, if we have immune suppression, that's a problem. Chronically, if we have reproductive suppression, that's a problem. Um, all of those things, metabolism, right? At the moment, it's great that we have all this glucose that's running through our body and can get into the brain, into the muscle, and help everything work. But long term, all this glucose into the circulation, that's actually called diabetes. So all of those things happen with chronic stress. And that's an important distinction, right? With acute stress is something that's helpful. Chronic, severe stress, maybe not so much. All of the psychological stress that we're mentioning is sort of this chronic stress. A lot of it is worrying. A lot of it is not an actual threat to our life. But interestingly, the response is just the same. So it doesn't need to be happening. It's enough that you're thinking and getting, and that's uh, mobilizing a stress response. What happens in the brain? We talked about all this peripheral stuff. What happens in the brain at the same time? When we're thinking about exposure to chronic stress in the brain level, we see a lot of areas of the brain that are activated by stress. 
as I said, every cell, every neuron, every other cell in the brain has the right receptors to see those enzymes, uh, to see those hormones, definitely for cortisol, but also for the hormones that come before that, the CRH and the ACTH, and all of them have effects. We see very um, high density of those receptors in several key brain areas. One is called the hippocampus. That's the brain area that is involved in learning and memory. It also is involved in regulating this HPA axis. So mobilizing the stress response itself is controlled by this area of the hippocampus, and that's a very stress-sensitive area, a lot of receptors. Amygdala, that's another area that's very important. That's sort of the fear, emotion circuitry uh, nucleus of the brain, and there's a lot of uh, responsiveness to stress over there. Um, and the frontal uh, lobe, the prefrontal cortex, for, uh, particularly have a lot of the stress receptors and is vulnerable to stress. What we see sort of follows that immediately. Um, there's an effect of chronic stress on executive functions that sit in the prefrontal cortex. So you'll see things like verbal, uh, verbal uh, abilities, calculus, decision making that are diminished with chronic stress. There's exacerbated neuronal death following neurological insults. So if you just hear about you know, stress kills cells in the brain, that's actually not true. Um, I can tell you that I tried for many years during my postdoc time to kill uh, neurons with glucocorticoids, and you can put as much as you want on them, they're not dying with that, but they do become more vulnerable, such that if a second thing is coming over, like a seizure, they're gonna die more readily. In the very extreme, there's memory problems, and in the very extreme, we'll see post-traumatic stress disorder. So complete reorganization, if you want, of the stress um, activity in the brain. Limbic system that are activated are the amygdala and the hippocampus that we just mentioned, uh, and we know that stress impairs memory uh, and increases the incidence of depression in psychopathologies. And I'll tell you that that's part of the story, but that's not all the story, right? This is not exactly the more, the worse. So the more stress that you have, the worse that the outcome is, because if you look at cognitive functions, and you're looking at stress level, or this could be cortisol level, this is not a linear uh, line. There's actually this optimum, and the optimum is a little bit of stress. So a little bit of stress is actually something that boosts up cognitive function, and we all sort of know that. We didn't really know what would be the molecular mechanism for that. That's one of the things that we set up to, to look at. Can we find what's the molecular mechanism for it? But then too much is what's gonna drive you into poor performance, poor cognitive, uh, uh, decision-making, so on. Right. So when we set up to look at it, we said let's zoom in and start looking at the molecular level and figure out if we can find actual molecules, actual cells that are changing and that are causing those gross uh, physiological uh, circuit level changes that we're seeing, that, that people are reporting. So. The, the, the shortest primer that one can have on the brain is there are different kinds of cells in the brain. The cells that get all the attention, and I would tell you that I don't think for the right reason, are neurons, right? So neurons are the important ones. They're the ones that transmit electrical pulses, and therefore they're the ones that create all this activity that we're very interested in. To do that, to, to, to be able to send electrical pulses, which is the way that neurons talk to one another, uh, they connect over uh, places where they touch each other, those are called synapses, and the pulses are sent along uh, processes, and the processes have to have some kind of insulation around them, like uh, an electrical wire does. This insulation is called in the brain myelin, or we also call it a lot of time white matter, gray matter would be where the cell is, and this processes in the myelin around it would be the white matter, and they are created by another cell. So if this is sort of a cartoon of what the brain might be, there's your neuron here, the neuron has around it the myelin, this purple cell is the oligodendrocyte, that cell creates the myelin, secretes it, and put this insulation around the neuron so they can send the information properly. And there's another kind of cell called the astrocytes, which were not thought to be very important. They were like support cell, glue cells, they're around to sort of keep the, the brain working. We didn't really know what they were doing. The more research is looking at them, the more we think they're super important. Um, the 
This project that I'm not going to talk a lot about today, the epilepsy, this, is, uh, this was one of those breakthrough moments for me where it became very evident that it's the astrocytes that are making all the decisions. And this is in a disease that is all about electrical information, right? So it's, uh, epilepsy is about uh, seizures, is about the way neurons are firing together. But the real mind behind it, the real programmer, is the astrocytes. And more and more, we see that they play a very important role. There's also microglia, which is sort of the um, resident immune system of the brain. It's the private immune system that, that the brain has. And again, we're finding out more and more along the time that they play a role in other things as well, even learning and memory, processes, and so on. When the brain develops, uh, we start with a series of divisions of stem cells. So during embryogenesis, there's a series of, of divisions, stem cells that are making decisions along the way to decide whether they're going to become um, neurons or astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. They terminally differentiate. They migrate to the right place. They make um, all the right processes and then start making those connections, those synaptic connections between them. And finally, you'll get this mature brain. About 50 to 70% of the neurons will actually go program cell death. So there's generation of more than we actually need. And then whatever is not connected and wired right will die off, right? And then those mature neurons are post-mitotic, meaning once the neurons became what they're going to be, they do not uh, go through uh, divisions anymore, right? So a neuron can't make more of itself. You have to have stem cells. There's the central dogma of neuroscience, which was different from anywhere else in the brain and was, um, was something that sort of was set in stone, if you wish, by uh, Ramoni Cajal many years ago. But all of us that uh, went through studies in their, up until maybe the 90s learned that as the central dogma of neuroscience. We were told that you're born with a set amount of neurons. And from that moment on, they can only die. But you never get new neurons because you don't have any more stem cells in the brain. Uh, you, you only have the neurons that you have. And they're going to die, or if you use them, if you, you know, maybe they'll die less. If you drink alcohol, maybe they'll die more. But basically, you have what you have, and now you go throughout life diminishing the amount of neurons. There's nothing that is regenerated in the brain. So he said, everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. Really gloom idea. Right. Now, consider this. I want to show you a movie. Right. We'll take a break for a minute and watch this lovely cat. Think YouTube. Um, this is the cat of a friend of mine, Brian Kolb. He lives in Canada. He has a farm. And he showed me this movie. The cat lost a leg to some wild animal. And you could see that he had difficulty walking around. Right. And this is in August. This is the same cat in November. Much more optimistic story, right? So I was very happy for Brian and his cat. But what that really made me think about is plasticity. The second movie, you can't even, if you do not know that the cat is missing a leg, you won't be able to tell. There's a huge difference, right? There had to be a remapping of a lot of cortical areas that control movement to, to move from that to that, right? There has to be a lot of plasticity to allow that level of, of change and that regeneration. This happens in stroke. Too. We all know people who had stroke. There is some regeneration after that. There's also things like learning, right? We learn new things. There must be some plasticity that controls that. And so what are the different levels that we can think about plasticity? There's differences in synaptic strength. The actual connection between new neurons, the strength of transmission could be different. There's synaptic remodeling. There could be synapses that come up or go away. And this is an example from uh, an exposure to a stressor. You look at this neuron in the hippocampus, and you see that it lost a lot of its synapses. A lot of those little boutons are lost between one and two. And that's another level of plasticity. There's synaptic uh, remodeling. There's dendritic remodeling. If you look at those neurons A and B, also from the hippocampus, you see that the control one has this big branch tree and it's losing it after stress. And I will tell you that more than that, 
in a fairly young brain, you will also see regeneration of that, right? So if we wait another month and that subject uh, now recuperated from the stress, there will be regrowth of that. So that's a lot of plasticity, right? If you go to a more aged brain, there might be not as much plasticity. But the most extreme of all is to think that there might be cell remodeling. Maybe there are cells that are dying that will fit with Ramon y Cajal, but maybe there are cells that are getting added to the circuit. And that's completely against the central dogma of neuroscience. And it turns out that there is. There actually is plasticity on the level of the cells. There are stem cells in the brain. They were discovered in, uh, in the brains of songbirds that learn a new song every season. It was uh, discovered by Fernando Notobam at Princeton University, and he showed that this depends on the generation of new neurons, right? So actually those songbirds, they learn a song, and there's a, a nucleus in the brain that grows with learning the song. There's all these new neurons that learn the song. At the end of the season, the thing dies completely and disappears. All those neurons die. Come the next season, they grow again this neuron population and learn another song. And when he found it, think, people thought it was very interesting, but then said, you know, this has nothing to do with the mammalian system. Uh, definitely, if it's in the mammalian system, it wouldn't have to do anything with the primate brain. Those are birds, they're really different. Long story short, 20 years later, we know that there are two areas of the brain, actually, in mammalian systems, in primate systems, in human brains, that generate new neurons. There are two pockets, at least, two pockets that we all agree on. There's other pockets or other little uh, populations that the, the community is still out debating whether they exist or not. But those two places, everybody agrees that occurs. There is the ventricles. Right around the ventricles, there's a population of stem cells that continuously makes new neurons that go into the olfactory bulb and make olfactory neurons, and only olfactory neurons in a normal brain. This is one place. We're not going to talk about that today. What we're going to talk about is the hippocampus, this area that's important for stress and for learning and memory and controlling the HPA axis. That area, within the hippocampus, there's one subfield of the hippocampus called the dentate gyrus, one subfield of the dentate gyrus called the subgranular zone, where we see stem cells that continuously divide, make more of themselves, and also are able to make cells that make the decision whether they're neurons or glia. They make those uh, neurons that then mature over several weeks, make the right projections, and after four, six, eight weeks, they look indistinguishable from their neighbors. We can't tell anymore that they were new, newly added to the brain, that they're newborn neurons. And there's not a lot of them, but there's enough of them that we now know that they're very important. Once those are mature, they express mature neuronal markers that display the morphology of the cells around them, so we really can't tell them apart. We start making those connections and receive information and send information just as you would expect from any other neuron. Interestingly, in their maturation, there's this point in time, maybe two, three weeks in time, that they're immature and they're hyper-excitable. And that's what makes them so important. This is why they play such important role in learning, in memory, in, um, in making a difference while you have not that many of them. Just to give you sort of an idea of numbers, if you look at humans during embryogenesis, during development, between five weeks and five months of the pregnancy, there's about a quarter of a million of neurons that are born per minute, right? In the adult human brain, we're talking about maybe 700 neurons per day, okay? So this is a low rate of generation, but functionally, they are very important. Now again, just as in development, about 50% of them will die within four weeks. So most of them are born and immediately dead. However, if they're activated, then they will survive. So this is sort of a use it, lose it kind of situation. If you don't use it, you're gonna lose it. If you use them and they're integrated into the circuitry and they get the right activation pattern, then they will stay more. You can look at um, uh, animals and follow those newborn neurons in situations where you're increasing the need for them, like a very complex environment, and much more of them will survive. Maybe 70% of them will survive now. We know that they're very important because we could actually um, ablate them. We could delete 
this population. We can do that pharmacologically with a drug, or we can irradiate the brain as you would like cancer cells, proliferating cells will die with irradiation, those cells will die with irradiation, or you can do a genetic trick to somehow only manipulate those cells. And all of those things were done, and we know that when you do that, you lose certain types of hippocampal dependent memory. So things that are, that the hippocampus plays a big role in learning or in remembering, you need those cells for it. We also know that the uh, HPA axis, that stress axis, is, acts differently when those cells are missing, so they're very important for controlling the stress axis. And we know that when you eliminate them, you don't get the effects of antidepressants. So it's not to say that they're specifically involved in depression, but antidepressants works through them. When you administer antidepressants to an animal, you get more generation of those cells, and when you eliminate those cells, antidepressants don't work on those animals. It's sort of interesting because it, it may provide an answer to why antidepressants take so long to work. It's sort of a just-so story. It's not something that we know scientifically, but there's always a mystery about antidepressants. When you give them to people, they don't start acting right away. There's a three to four week delay. And it doesn't really make sense because what we're told that they do is that they increase the level of serotonin in the synapse. That's something that will happen within minutes to hours. Yet the effect takes three to four weeks, right? What does take three to four weeks is the maturation of those cells. So just a correlation, but an interesting one. When you look at the activation of those immature neurons, there are times that they're activated. We see more of them being activated in a specific environment. For instance, if it's a very complex environment that we're exposing the animal to, you'll see more of those cells being activated. In a very taxing, complex learning situation, like pattern discrimination, we will see activation of those cells, right? So think about this, for example. Let's say that there was a maze in the middle of this room, and I'm asking you to find a treat. This is a Fruit Loop. The rats really like Fruit Loops. You can imagine that's actually fantastic chocolate that you're trying to remember where I hid from you. And in this situation, it's either here or at the other end of the room. Those two ends of the room look very different from one another. The rats can do that with or without those cells. If I ablate all of those cells, they still remember how to find the Fruit Loops if they're there or there. But when you do the same thing, and those are in these two arms, so now it's going to be either here or here, now I need to remember many more details to be able to discriminate between this and this. And this is something that you can't do without those newborn neurons. So the more taxing, the more fine tuning is where you need those, those cells. Here's another example for pattern discrimination. If I'm asking you to look at this, remember this, remember the details of that, and now I'm gonna give you number G and ask is that the same or not? If you have really, really fine details, then you're able to say that this object here is not like that right corner object over there. But if you remember that in sort of vague details, then it's very hard to discriminate between those two. Right? So that's where we see activation of those cells. We also see activation of those cells in remembering fear uh, context, where the activation is actually dependent on input from the amygdala, from that fear area of the brain, right? So when we put the animals in, a, in, a, in an environment where they give them a little shock, and then we test them afterwards and see whether we get activation of those cells and they remember that the environment was frightening, they do that with super activating of those newborn cells that respond or sort of put together information from the hippocampus that tells us about spatial memory and the amygdala that tells us this was a scary place. There was an emotional valence to that place. If we take away the amygdala, we don't see this hyperactivation anymore. Those cells are also very much regulated by factors. Um, environmental enrichment, complex environments, learning situation increases the proliferation of those cells, physical exercise, uh, running on a treadmill, boosts the proliferation of those cells. Antidepressants, I said, um, there's a paper that shows uh, that sexual activity can boost that. It's actually an interesting one. Both sex and physical exercise are one that where we see increase of the stress hormones, yet it pushes it up. But when we have stress and an increase of that stress hormone, it pushes it down. 
right? So it's context dependent. So when it's stress that is somehow um, something that you choose or that you have some reward with, like physical exercise or sexual activity, it boosts the proliferation of those cells. And if it's something that's stressful or negative, then you have a decrease. Interestingly enough, somebody actually did the, the PE experiment where you said physical exercise, but we're going to make you do the physical exercise. You put a little treadmill and the rat has to run on that treadmill and then you don't have the proliferation. You actually have a decrease, right? So you really do have to have some kind of reward that comes with it. So stress is something that pushes it down, uh, chronic stress, aging, jet lag as well. And we wanted to ask, what's the mechanism for that? How does stress do that to those cells? What is the molecular mechanism? Those are um, graduate students, um, Sundri and Erin in a postdoc, Karishma, who worked on this project along the years, asking the question of where does stress and glucocorticoid or cortisol, the stress hormone, work on that axis? Interestingly enough, it could be anywhere, right? It could be the proliferation of those stem cells. How many more of them cells can they make? It could be how much they're differentiating into neurons or astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. I'll tell you that about 95% of the cells make neurons in a regular situation. Or it could be the survival of those cells that are born. And the answer was sort of everything, right? So there's a lot of different levels in which it did, uh, it, which it did those effects. One of the first things we saw that chronic stress decreases the proliferation of those cells. They make less of themselves and they make less neurons. And that followed a lot of literature. There's a lot of other people that showed that and knew that you start seeing less of this newborn neuron with stress. But what was really surprising to us is that at the same time, we started seeing an increase in oligodendrocytes. It actually pushed the cells, and we showed a transcriptional reprogramming of those cells to become oligodendrocytes. And that's surprising. Like, why would you get more oligodendrocytes in that little area of the hippocampus? We had to actually see that those were the cells that are doing it, right? How do we know that it's that stem cell that is becoming more oligodendrocytes? Maybe it's something else. Maybe those oligodendrocytes are coming from somewhere else. And so we did that in two ways. One was we said, let's lineage trace those cells. We could actually put a genetic marker into those cells. They're going to rest in yellow, and now we're going to follow their fate. And if we're correct, then we should get yellow oligodendrocytes. And we did. We would get more oligodendrocytes if the animal was exposed to stress or to cortisol. So cortisol actually pushed away those cells that would become 95% of them will become neuron, and now many more of them would become actually oligodendrocytes. The other way to ask that is to say we could actually take those cells out of the brain, those stem cells, and we can culture them in a dish and throw the stress hormone on them and see what happens. And when we do that, we get a decrease in the amount of neurons that they're producing and an increase in the amount of oligodendrocytes that we're generating in that dish. We then moved on to do a lot of work on asking what's the molecular mechanism, what's the transcriptional programming that they go through and showed that they're changing their fate. But at the end of it, what we really wanted to know is what does it mean? What does it mean to have a little more oligodendrocytes in your adult hippocampus? And we said what that means to us is that you're going to have an increased capacity to produce myelin. So you're going to have more myelin in your hippocampus. And he said, it, it, does that even ring a bell? You know, we went to the literature and said, do we see anything like that? When you go to the literature, you see that it turns out that there are changes in white matter or in myelin in a lot of different ways. Now, nobody's looked specifically at the hippocampus, but when you're looking at other brain areas, people said there are changes that come in depression, in schizophrenia, maybe ADHD. And early life stress is associated with vulnerability to mental illness and changes in white matter. So we decided to look at the human brain. We are not able, as, as of yet, to look for those stem cells in the human brain. There's no marker for them. We, we need to have a way to, to actually have the brain. So there's some post-mortem work, but we can't look at them uh, during. But what we can look at is myelin. We can image myelin with MRI. And we did that in collaboration with uh, UCSF colleagues, Tom Nealon and Linda Chow. And they looked at a very specific population. They took veterans that were exposed to trauma. And they said, let's look at uh, 
veterans that had, were exposed to no trauma, veterans that were exposed to trauma and did not develop post-traumatic stress disorder, and veterans that were exposed to trauma and developed post-traumatic stress disorder. And what we saw is that just as we would predict from the animal studies, from the mice studies, you get an increase in myelin specifically in the hippocampus, so where you wouldn't expect it to be, basically, which uh, made us feel sort of very secure in, in, in continuing to ask those questions and thinking that they might actually have a, a clinical significance to come with them. And so we know that they might play a role, those cells play a role in emotional memory. We know that that is very much changed in post-traumatic stress disorder, and we know that uh, those cells play a role in that. So the next thing that we wanted to use the system for is to ask, might that be the link for sort of a trajectory? If you have an early life environment that changes the way that those stem cells in the brain behave in the hippocampus, could that be sort of what puts you on a trajectory for resilience versus a trajectory for vulnerability to mental illness that might come later on in life? And to do that, we used um, an interesting model of early life environment. We actually did not manipulate anything, but we recorded the behavior of rat mothers. And this is not, um, this is following a lot of work in the literature, starting from Michael Meany's lab uh, in Montreal and Darlene Francis here at Berkeley, that were showing that when you look at a population of rat moms, they will fall on uh, some kind of a curvature of how much they're licking and grooming their pups, right? So there would be some variation. There are some moms that are really over licking and grooming and do, you know, play a lot with the rats, some that are very neglectful. If we take the two extremes, this purple work uh, group and this green group, the very high licking and grooming, the very low licking and grooming, and we compare them to one another, there are big differences between them. There's differences in the stress reactivity. The low licking and grooming one are much more stress reactive. They're much more anxious. They don't do as well cognitively. Their HPA axis is overactivated, and they have less glucocorticoid receptors in their hippocampus. And that was shown to be epigenetically mediated. We wanted to see whether those stem cells in the hippocampus also look different in those populations. And what we find is that very, very much so. So if looking at the, here, the, the block ones are the low lichen and grooming, and the checkered ones are the high lichen and grooming, you can see that there's a very, very big difference in the proliferation rate, in how much those stem cells are able to proliferate to make more of themselves. There's also a very big difference in how much they're making neurons. Right? So the high lichen grooming animals have much more proliferation in their brains, in their hippocampus. When we look at the oligodendrocytes, we see the opposite. Right? So actually the low lichen and grooming, the ones that uh, possibly are the neglectful mothers, so maybe more stress in their early life, they make more oligodendrocytes. And that carries all the way into adulthood. P90 is three months old rat, which is an adult rat. So into adulthood, those brains are very different in terms of, of the proliferation of those stem cells and in terms of how much oligodendrocyte they're making. Are they actually making more myelin? And the answer was yes. They're making more myelin, and they're making more myelin specifically in hippocampal regions and not in other places, right? So they're not really changing white matter as such in other places, but they're changing white matter in a specific area that's very important for learning and memory and stress reactivity. And that also carries into adulthood. You can see that this is actually a very, very uh, impressive difference. And you have to remember that we didn't manipulate anything, right? We only recorded this natural variation in the um, animal behavior. So this tells us something about what happens with chronic stress and why chronic stress would actually impair memory and impair uh, cognition and all of those things. But remember, we started with this question that said, there's also an optimal amount of stress. There's some stress that actually could be good for you, right? So what, is there a molecular mechanism for that? Can we see what happens to those cells when we have just the right amount of stress. And that was done by uh, Liz Kirby and David and Sandra uh, that were working on this project and found a really, really interesting correlation in those cells. 
So we're now exposing the animals to a very short, brief, moderate stress. It's not too much. They're actually, they're put in a bag and they're unable to move for about three hours. It's not painful, but it's uncomfortable and psychologically stressful for them to be in that hour. But that's all, three hours. We look at them at the end of this three hours and we can see an increase in the proliferation of those cells. We see an increase in prolifer proliferation of those cells with the um, behavior, with the immobilization, but we could also check what's the amount of circulating cortisol or corticosterone in the, in the case of the rat and inject that same amount and we get the same thing. So you, I can just inject the stress hormone for them, to them, wait three hours and I get an increase in proliferation of those stem cells. What happens with those stem cells? To ask this question, we used um, this fear paradigm where we're habituating the animals to, uh, to the context. We're then giving them a very short, brief uh, foot shock. Again, not, uh, not painful, but sort of alarming. The next day that you put them in the box, we can look at their stress response by freezing. They're gonna freeze in the context. And then you can teach them that this is not a, a, a threatening context by exposing them again to the same context and you see how long does it take them to extinct the response. When do they learn to not freeze in that context? And we can try different timelines. So we can test right away after the acute stress. If we have increased proliferation here, those cells are gonna be too young to do anything. So I wouldn't actually guess that they should do anything immediately after the stress. If I wait about two weeks, three weeks, those should be this hyper excitable cells. Now there's more of them. If they're so important as I told you, they should be protective at this point, right? And this rat that has this moderate amount of stress should be protected from the second stressor that comes along. And indeed that was the case, right? So when we look immediately after this brief stressor, I don't see any differences in the way that they learn how to extinct. But when I look at uh, two weeks later, we see that those uh, animals that got the immobilization stress, they're protected, right? They do better. When we look at the activation of those cells, we can actually mark those cells. I know when they were born, and I can look at activity gene that's turned on in them when they're activated, and I see this hyper-selective activation of those cells. So those cells are activated during the second stressor and sort of participate in buffering the, the second stressor or doing better with the second stressor. So now came the question of sort of, can we find a molecular switch that turns this uh, acute moderate stressor that's actually beneficial for you and makes you do better with the second stressor that comes along to something that becomes deleterious, something that's not good. This is chronic and too much, and now we have all this decrease in proliferation and increase in dendrogenesis. What's the switch between those two? And I'm not gonna show you, uh, this is a very long molecular story, but I can tell you the, the two endpoints of that. And interestingly, it turned out to be all about the astrocytes. Turned out that who actually makes the switch is the astrocytes. Those astrocytes that are around the stem cells, they're very close to them, they're actually in very close proximity to those stem cells, receive the stress signal, and in the case of acute stress, they secrete a molecule that's a growth factor. It's called FGF2. And that growth factor goes out and activates those stem cells and make them proliferate more, and make them make more of themselves and make them more neurons, and then those neurons are protective. When this stress becomes elongated, when it's much more than that, the astrocytes start doing something else. Our first guess was the astrocytes are gonna stop making that FGF2, and actually they don't. They continue to do that FGF2, but somehow the stem cells stop responding to that. Turns out that what the astrocytes are doing at the same time is when that stress becomes very elongated, they start depleting another protein. So they turn down a protein called noggin, and that protein regulates some pathway in the stem cells that continues their proliferation. And now it pushes them out of proliferative cycle and makes them uh, not, not go through the cycle anymore, right? So they stop responding to those cues and they're not participating anymore in that whole game of we're proliferate, we're not proliferating, we're just, it's just pushed out into senescence. They're not in the cell cycle anymore. They don't respond to the FGF2, 
And that explains also that shift so that now they start differentiating and they start differentiating in the wrong way because those transcription factors go up. So there's sort of the switch that occurs through the astrocytes. So that was interesting. We wanted to start asking questions that do more on the system level, right? So we know now how those cells play a role in learning and memory and spatial memory, but what about the social brain, right? Could that be um, some part of it? This is work that was done again by Liz Kirby and Sandra, and uh, I'll talk also about work by uh, two postdocs, fantastic postdocs, Snooper Aminian and Bal Bartal, that are working on a pro-social behavior. And the reasoning behind that was there's a very close link between social environment and stress responses. So first of all, the social environment could be a very, very potent stressor. One of the most potent stress paradigms in animals is uh, um, something that's called a social defeat. And this is sort of a bullying paradigm. You take an animal and you have a bully uh, animal, a, a bully mouse if you want, that comes into their cage and for 10 minutes uh, is there, is bigger than them, he might beat them up, he chases them, really bullying them for this 10 minutes. That's not a lot, right? What happens for the next 24 hours is that they share the cage without being able to have physical contact with one another. So now there's sort of this um, wire mesh in between the two of them. He can smell them, he can hear them, he can see them, but they can't beat him up. You do that for 10 days, you get now the resident mouse, the one that got bullied, they, won't, they don't want any social contact anymore whatsoever. They just withdraw completely. If you put them in any social choice kind of thing, they would just go away. They don't want to interact. They don't even want to interact with juvenile rats that are smaller or juvenile mice that are smaller than them. Don't. So social environment is a very, very potent stressor by itself. One thing. But also stress responses themselves could be buffered by a positive social interaction. We know that having a positive social interaction reduces the stress response in humans and in animal models. Um, we know that stress can actually promote adaptive relationships in humans, right? So if, if people go through a stressor together, they would tend to actually get uh, stronger social bonds between them. But on the other hand, stress could also uh, precipitate sort of psychopathologies that are characterized by social withdrawal, like depression, like post-traumatic stress disorder. So on the one hand, social interaction, positive social interaction, social affiliation could be the one thing that sort of helps you in buffers. And sometimes stress will make you seek those, but sometimes stress would actually make you withdraw completely and go towards social withdrawal. And so can we, can we build a model for that? And so what Liz and Sandra did is they started putting the animals into this acute immobilization stress, just as I said before, three hours in that bag, and say, let's look at the home cage. What happens at the level of the home cage? Can we see social interactions in the natural environment of the animals? They would go at night and film the cage and look at social interactions. And what they saw was a lot of pro-social bonding. They would be huddling the animals that went through the stressor during the day together would sort of huddle one with another. Um, they looked, um, they would do more allo grooming than self grooming. There was no aggression whatsoever. Other cages, you would see some aggression, you would see some social interactions, but also a lot of other behaviors. What we also saw that this acute immobilization stress led to lasting facilitation of sharing. What do I mean by that? If we take away the water from the cage for a couple of hours, and then we bring it back, there's one water bottle now, and the two rats are supposed to share it together. In a control group, they would sort of fight over it. Half the time they're fighting, nobody's even drinking. Half the time someone is drinking. If there's a very strong um, hierarchy, the, the dominant one will dominate and not let the other one drink so much. When you do the stress experiment, all of a sudden they're sharing it beautifully. There's no fighting over it. 100% of the time it's actually used by either one or the other. There's much less fighting over it. We actually see them sort of push away the other one in a control situation, but not after stress. After stress, they become really good at resource sharing. There's much reduced aggression. Um, interestingly, but the, the complicated point, the dominance hierarchy is actually steeper. It, uh, I can get into that if it's interesting to somebody and you want to ask about it. At the same time, what we see 
is that this acute immobilization stress increases a hormone in the brain that has to do with social affiliation, oxytocin. Oxytocin is this, uh, was known as this love hormone. Now it's much more complicated than that. It's actually sort of a hormone that pushes social bonds with in-group. So that means you have a strong affiliation now with the other rat that went through the stress with you. There you're in group and now you're more bonded to them. And that comes with more oxytocin and more of the oxytocin receptor. So that fits all of that human literature about sort of seeking support and having this social support that can buffer the stress response. What happens if we do exactly the same thing, but now we also add a context of odor? So in one case, we were adding peppermint odor. So you're in your little uh, bag, and you can't move for three hours, and it's really annoying you, and you're smelling peppermint. Very natural, very neutral. There's not, not anything special about it. The second group went through the same thing, but the odor that we added to them was a fox urine. So a predator, right? So now you can't move, and it's kind of annoying, but you're also thinking that there's a fox that's right next to you and going to come and eat you right away. So the context is a little bit different. We then run exactly the same set of experiments, and it turns out that in that case, all of the good things that we saw before disappear. There's no more increased oxytocin. There's no more resource sharing. There's no huddling. There's no cuddling. None of that. Right? This was too much, and now you don't get that increase in social effects. So that's one way that we can think about sort of social behavior and how come we get those two different um, effects on the this, on this social world. In Ball and Nuper asked an even more complicated question. They actually came with this really ambitious idea that they want to study not just social behavior, but they want to study a specific kind of social behavior, pro-social helping behavior. Uh, they, they came and they said, we want to study empathy. The empathy in rats, that would be interesting. But um, they convinced me after a while, and we decided to look at that and um, use a very interesting model that uh, Inbal developed, which is looking at a helping behavior. Right? So this is now sort of an altruistic behavior. This is a rat that will help another rat that's in distress. What she does is she puts them in a big arena, and in that big arena, one of the rats is going to be in a restrainer. The other rat is running around. Turns out that the other rat will spend a lot of effort to try to release that trapped rat. Actually give them an hour a day, over 12 days, they would spend the hour circling around and trying to help, and they learn how to open the cage door, and they become very consistent in helping the rats inside. You can try to tempt them by putting a chocolate restrainer there, and they would actually release the rat and share the chocolate with the one that was in there. So very specific helping behavior. Very motivated, very goal-oriented. They don't just do it. If the restrainer is empty, they don't spend the same amount of time there. So they do it because they want to, or because there's, the, there's this rat inside. But they don't do it for every rat. They do it for a cage mate. So if they were housed together with that rat, they'll do it. If it's another rat from the same strain as them, they'll do it. If you take a rat from a different strain, they don't help. They actually are not interested. They will go around. They will not help. They will help only who they know. Now, what happens if you take that other rat from this other strain and you house them together? They spend two weeks in the same cage. Then they'll open. Right? So now, this other rat from this other strain become their in-group, and they make a decision, and they help that other rat. 